And so before we again begin to, submer begin to submerge into the depths of our inheritance and begin to study it, the epigraph for our study of the Word of God is Luke 24, 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And for us as partakers of the body of Christ, to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that is written about him in Scripture, we shall continue our study of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and what is necessary to be done from our side so that we can receive the right to the power to put off our former way of life so we can put on the new way of life. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And as we know, to fulfill this command, we need to utilize three charging and fundamental verbs, and these are to put off, be renewed, and put on. And to confirm the given promise elevated in status of a commandment, we will read another place of Scripture. And so, again, this is our purpose when we will be garmented into the new person, then all of these corrupt desires will immediately be silenced and will not be able to bring us discomfort. We will read another place of scripture. This place is written by the same author. He, in a little bit of a different format, identifies a similar truth, calling us to take off the old man with his deeds so we can put on the new man. It is necessary to know specific places of scripture. This is not just a pulled out place of scripture from the Bible and that others don't exist. That's not the case in this matter. Colossians 3, 8 through 14. But you now yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against all the whales of the devil. You also need to be in sincerity with each other, and if anyone has anything against each other, needs to be forgiven them. And you also put on the love, which is the perfection of all things. Here in this place of scripture, it also talks about us putting off the old man so we can put on the new, that will, which will be revealing God's love. Ephesians 6, 11 through 13. You put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wheels of the devil. All this armor of God is our new person because our wrestle against is not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day, and having done all to, to stand. Ephesians 6, 11 through 13. Romans 13, 12 through 14, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of the darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and darkness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. We've noted that specifically your decision regarding these three destiny-affecting words to put off, be renewed, and put on will determine whether you transform yourself into a vessel of mercy or a vessel of wrath. Or more specifically, will the completion of our salvation happen that is given to us in the format of a guarantee or will we lose it and our names be forever blotted out of the book of life, although they may have been written there 
at one time. We in a specific format have already looked at the first two questions and have been studying the next question, what conditions are we to fulfill, so that by the means of an already renewed mind we begin the process of dressing ourselves into the power of our new person that is created in accordance to God, in Christ Jesus, in righteousness and holy truth. When speaking about clothing ourselves into the power of our new person that contains the power of the resurrection of Christ, we've concluded that we need God's help. That is, we need His mercy. <clears throat> the means of receiving any kind of help from God, which we see as the inheritance of the mercies of God, or the work of the redemption of God, is the weaponry of prayer and worship. Since prayer isn't just a man's means of com communicating with God, but also a kind of legal and sacral right that a man gives heaven, a tool that activates the given law of God, man gives heaven this right so that heaven may intervene upon the earth. Relevant to this is one of the prayers of David that is written in the 143rd Psalm. This psalm very clearly opens up the conditions, the grounds upon which a person is called to prepare a legal foundation for God so that God would intervene with his mercy into your life, as well as in the boundaries of those aspects that we rule over and that we carry responsibility for before God. This has become the component with which we have been studying. Let's read this prayer and again and again make this prayer our own prayer. Psalm 143, 1 through 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness answer me, and in your righteousness. Do not enter into judgment with your servant. For in your sight no one living is righteous. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me dwell in darkness like those who have long been dead. Therefore my spirit is overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is distressed. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the works of your hands. I spread out my hands to you. My soul longs for you like a thirsty land. Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for your righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. For David, as well as for us, to hear the mercy of God, we, like David, need to present to God legal grounds or a particular right. And such evidence in this prayer, as we already know, were ten unique in their nature arguments, identifying the right to enter the presence of God, founded upon the laws of God, which is the word of God that, ca that comes out of his mouth. This word God has magnified above all his name, and this word he willingly submits to. Specifically, these ruling and mighty words of God converted into promises and commandments for man, David presented to God as the consistency of his heart, saying to God, Hear me, in your faithfulness and your righteousness, hear me, because I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. Hear me, because I spread out my hands to you. Hear me, for in you do I trust. Hear me, because I lift up my soul to you. Hear me, because in you I take shelter. Shelter. Hear me, for you are my God. Hear me for your name's sake. Hear me for your righteousness' sake. And hear me, for I am your servant. This is the tenth. In the previous services, we had already studied the nature of the first argument that abided in David's heart. This was evidence that the faithfulness and righteousness abided in David's heart. This served as legal grounds for God, giving God the ability to hear David and to stand on the side of David in his oppositions against his enemies. And we stopped to study the second argument 
This is a very unique argument. Is the presented by David evidence that in his heart the memories of the days of old were imprinted and all of the deeds that God had done in those old days. He carried it in his heart and it was continually first and always fresh in his heart. He looked at it, he meditated about it, he, con he confessed it before God. Based on the revelation of the Holy Spirit, we began to study the form of the evidence of this evidence in the breastplate of judgment of the high priest. This item is unique and is a continual memorial before God, identifying with itself continual prayer. There are a lot of things in our life that are a memory before God. But this memory is a continual memory before God. <clears throat> and the breastplate of judgment was created and served only one item. This was the Urim and the Thummim within the heart of a man, the presence of which allowed God to hear man and, and allowed man to hear God. Therefore, to be heard by God in the revelations of his Urim, it was necessary to keep within his mind uh, the works of God that had been done in the days of old. That was his Thummim. The breastplate of judgment as a continual memorial before God is a sacral symbol of the format of continual prayer, providing God grounds to fulfill His will upon planet Earth, prayer that does not satisfy the requirements and characteristics of the breastplate of judgment does not have the right to be called prayer, as only the format of continual prayer presented in the breastplate of, of judgment of the high priest gives us the right to come close to God and enter into the holy place as kings and priests of God to present intercession that pursues the interests of His will. Here's how Apostle Paul presents the nature of the breastplate of judgment, symbolizing continual prayer in his books. Shortly, as in a telegram, Col Colossians 4.2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. We note that continuity or earnesty in prayer identifies a joyously burning lamp, identifying the condition of the righteous heart of a man. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. Proverbs 13, 9. <coughs> and so when it says put out, that means it dies in the original. The order in which the breastplate of judgment was built identified and enjoined the demands of spirit and truth that the true worshipers of God whom God seeks need to be in accordance to and need to possess. And he still has not found peace until he finds a specific number of worshipers that worship in spirit and in truth. That is why he's still looking. John 4, 23, 24. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. If the building order of the breastplate of judgment is interfered, the breastplate of judgment loses its nature and its purpose. The breastplate of judgment identified the state of the heart of a worshiper of God. Worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth includes not peddling with the truth when pursuing the goals that God has placed in Scripture, as people have done at all times and many do today because of their stiff neck and to benefit their greed and their hypocrisy. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.17 In the Septuagint, this is the translation, our translation, the breastplate of judgment is called the sign of justice, as by the means of the Urim and the Thummim, that is contained in the breastplate of judgment, God revealed to man his judgment, man was able to hear God, and God was able to hear man. The breastplate of judgment is identified as the conscience of a man, it symbolizes the conscience of a man purified from dead works, upon the tablets of whom, just as a sign it, in the twelve names of the patriarchs, the teaching of Christ that came in the flesh is imprinted. A conscience purified of dead works with the imprinted faithfulness and righteousness upon its tablets is called to give God the right to function in them and through them upon planet Earth. In a specific format, we have already looked at the measurements and nature of materials with which the breastplate of judgment was built that we are called to be in accordance to within our spirit and stop to study 
the next requirements that shows Exodus 20 17 through 21 and you shall put settings of stone in it four rows of stones the first row shall be sardius topaz and emerald the second row shall be turquoise sapphire and diamond third row jacinth agate and amethyst and fourth row beryl onyx and jasper they shall be set in gold settings and the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names. Like the engraving of a sign, each one with its own name, they shall be according to the twelve tribes. Practically, our heart, in our conscience, we, we need these stones, uh, the teaching of Christ, to be placed into these settings, and our prayers need to be in accordance to these 12 uh, settings. We've noted that the 12 golden settings is the authority, rule, and order of the Word of God contained in the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh, <clears throat> that we as worshipers of God are called to present within the foundation of our continual prayer. The 12 precious stones with engraved upon them as a sign it, names of the sons of Israel is a symbol and format of our continual prayer presenting the perfect judgments of God. From this we can see that it wasn't the golden settings being the truth of the word of God that were adjusted in measurement and configuration to fit the precious stones but the precious stones themselves these are our prayers are the ones that were adjusted and configured to fit the golden settings of truth. Continual prayer in the 12 precious stones of the breastplate of judgment with the 12 names is a persisting prayer that in its intercession presents the interests of the will of God and does not sway or step away from the goal until what is asked for is received. This is the most powerful prayer, a persisting prayer, continual. Building of the breastplate of judgment within our heart is revealed as building the kingdom of heaven in the image of the tree of life that John saw upon the island Patmos. God showed him these things that are to happen in the heart of a man. Growing the tree of life within your heart, this is the kingdom of heaven, the tree of life, is building yourself up into a new person, created in accordance to God in righteousness and holy truth into a spiritual house and a holy priesthood. With this we will note that all of the beauty and order of the temple of Solomon was created for one holy item and served the one item. This was the golden ark of the covenant. The same thing with the ephod of the high priest with the connected to it breastplate of judgment. It was created for and served only one holy item. This item very accurately was called to duplicate and fulfill the function of the golden ark. This was the Urim and the Thummim. Because the go golden ark of the covenant as well as the breastplate of judgment symbolize from different angles and with various purposes the conscience of a man cleansed from dead works. Urim and Thummim in Hebrew means light and perfection, light and the right, or revelation and truth. For example, the Ten Commandments inside the Ark of the Covenant, presenting Jesus Christ as the Word of God that came out of the mouth of God, is the truth. And this truth upon the breastplate of judgment is the Thummim, the revelation that a person could receive at the lid of the Ark, mercy seat, is the Urim in the breastplate of judgment. Therefore, only a person who has a conscience cleansed from dead works or who has a wise heart upon the tablets of whom the truth in the form of the Thummim is imprinted can be a worshiper of God. The revelation of God by the means of his Urim can function only within the boundaries of truth. This truth within the heart of a person is the Thummim, the teaching of Jesus Christ that came in the flesh. As it is written, I have put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. Exodus 31.6 God will never reveal or put his wisdom into a foolish heart one of the flesh, one that is still an infant because there is no thummim there, there's no teaching of Christ that came in the flesh there. A person has not placed it there, he doesn't understand it, he has not comprehended it. What is written in scripture is one thing, but when this truth and the 12 elementary teachings of Christ are rewritten and impl imprinted as a seal or sign it upon our heart, then God seeing this sends his Urim, his Holy Spirit, and he begins 
begins to reveal within our heart the meaning and the mystery of those words. But for us, it is necessary to receive them. But we don't want to understand. Often people don't want to accept something that they don't understand. People say, well, I don't accept what I don't, what I don't understand. But God says, I can't then reveal it to you what you don't understand because you don't receive it. When we accept it and place it upon in, in upon the uh, golden table of showbreads, he will see these showbreads upon the golden table and then he will send his urim. And when he sends his urim, then we will understand what it means. He'll say, now you can come and eat. But before this, it will be the food of God. This is very important because people get irritated, get complain. I don't understand anything. I said, I say, it's not possible you don't understand anything. Listen attentively. There's some things you will understand. What you understand, eat it. Take it in. Those things you don't understand, still hold on to it. If the Holy Spirit, uh, when He comes, uh, He needs to be able to find something there that you don't understand to be able to reveal it to you. And He will uh, reveal it by the preached word. Uh, he will place it in place it into our heart by the preached word and will explain it also by the preached word. The friendship of the Thummim and the Urim in the heart of a person is a unification of two formats of wisdom, which states that the carriers of the Thummim and the Urim are true worshippers of God and possess the immune system of the Holy Spirit. And if it's possible to blaspheme against the Father and the Son, then if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, a person will not be forgiven in this age or the next. That's what Christ said himself. Because the Holy Spirit, not looking at the fact that he's God, does not have a self-defense inside of himself. He's not able to protect himself. He, you can trample upon him and he can't defend himself or protect himself in any way. The Father, as soon as he is blasphemed against, he breaks the relationship. The Holy Spirit, no. You offend him, but he, being offended, remains. Sometimes offended, spat at, and locked away because we all... Uh, uh, we uh, uh, have opened up our spirit to our own desires instead of the will of God. Deuteronomy 33, 8-11, God said of Levi, this name has a, the destiny of the carriers of the Urim and the Thummim. And of Levi he said, Let your Thummim and your Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa and with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who says of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children. For they have observed your word and kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the works of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him, that they rise not again. This is a prophetic blessing that was spoken by Moses. And it was confirmed as soon as something was confessed as the faith of the heart, these words are confirmed. They pretty much obtain the legal power that they need to function. And they become law before God because he gave these words and he submits himself to his own words. And you need to understand that if we do something against these people, those who carry the urm and the thummim, what will happen? Oftentimes people are afraid to criticize people of the flesh that say something. When people of the flesh speak the word of God, they speak of their own thing and not what is in their heart. So against those of the flesh uh, are inspected and controlled and so forth because these are dangerous actually people in the church and they are the ones who will lead uh, a majority of the people into hell instead of heaven. You need to separate the delegated from God and those who attempt to call themselves so, not being those. 
In a specific format, we have already looked at five qualities of a warrior in prayer and the five precious stones of the breastplate of judgment by which God was able to continuously reveal his will upon planet Earth and stop to study the sixth quality and the precious diamond stone. We know now that the sixth name carved upon the precious stone of the breastplate of judgment upon the tablets of our heart is the name of the sixth son of Jacob Naphtali, which means wrestler. Genesis 37, 8, And Rachel's maid Bela conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali, one who prevails in prayer or one who allows God to pray together with him, the Holy Spirit, so that he can prevail in prayer against the powers of darkness that stand upon his way of fulfilling the will of God. The name of God presented in the precious diamond stone, every precious stone presents the name, a name of God. According to the Jewish rabbinate, the precious diamond stone is El Hai, which when translated means God is alive or living. Therefore, according to the definition of the name Naphtali upon the precious diamond stone, we can conclude that the function of the sixth principle as the format of continual prayer is our right and our ability to allow the Holy Spirit to abide with us in our prayer battles against the powers of hell which confront us when we fulfill the will of God by the name of the living God. And so when we're talking about the living God, we state in Jeremiah 10.10, but the Lord is the true God, he is the living God, and the everlasting king. At his wrath the earth will tremble, and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. The name of the living God is the format of an oath, and the category of the nation that had not learned to swear by the living God, or swore falsely, were utterly destroyed. Jeremiah 12.16.17 And it shall be, if they will learn carefully the ways of my people, and so this is this place of scripture is important for those who take the words of God into their mouth but do not have it in their heart. And they sh if they shall learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name, as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. Therefore, to not be plucked up and destroyed by the wrath of the living God, it is necessary to learn the ways of the nation of God to swear by the name of God El Hai, or by the living God. These ways are the paths of the commandments and statutes of God. The condition that gives us the right to learn the ways or paths of God's commandments and His statutes to swear by the name of the living God is the thirst to know them. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. When my heart will begin to bear fruit, then will I run the course of your commandments. In the original, enlarge when I will bear fruit. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I will observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. We note that in Hebrew, the name of God El Hai, one who is alive or living, is one who abides, one who is, with unconditional authority, one who defines the Genesis, creates the Genesis, holds the Genesis, keeps the Genesis, rules over the Genesis, and is the commander and lord of the Genesis. Deuteronomy 10, 20 through 21. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oath in his name. He is your praise, and He is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. When it says, swear by the living God, name of the living God, that doesn't mean swear uh, in His name at, with simple things, as people do. They begin to say, I swear by my mother, by my father, their children, and so forth, something important to them. We always need to understand that this oath needs to be only in regards to his promises. The Lord lives. I will take this promise. 
by the power of his Holy Spirit, according to his great mercy. When you say, the Lord lives, this is an oath. This is the one you swear, uh, you swear in his name. As we sing, I will still get there. I shall enter my inheritance and take it. And so when you say, the Lord lives, this is an oath. The power of a warrior in prayer contained within the virtue of the name of the living God was called to present the unlimited power of God over the Genesis and the allotted by him for us time and boundaries. Therefore, it was necessary for us to look at and determine what goal God has in his intentions when he urges and calls his children to become warriors in prayer. Also, in what way and upon what conditions is God able to and desires to give man the right to become a warrior in prayer so that man may present the interests of God and implement or actualize his inheritance in God. The will of God is that we actualize these uh, imperishable inheritance and not that we materialistically prosper. God's not against materialistic prosperity, <clears throat> but it's somewhere in the back for him. He tells us not to worry about it <clears throat> because he says this is my prerogative, the one that I give, how much I give to each one. He says be content with what you have, but your prerogative, God says to man, you need to seek the imperishable inheritance and that's me. Know him. Per the definitions provided in Scripture, to be a warrior in prayer is the lawful and privileged inheritance of holy men of all days. This is their primary or first most purpose <clears throat> that is revealed in their calling to trample upon uncleanness and the unclean in their prayer battles as the dust in the streets. This is one of the greatest positions that is gifted by God to man, in which a person becomes a king and a priest to God and is seen by God as a brilliant stone or the diamond stone with the name of Naphtali. Not being a king and a priest to God in the virtue of which a person receives the unique ability and right to reign with his informational organ over his emotional organ. It is impossible to be and remain a warrior in prayer. We note that the informational organ is called to reign over the emotional aspect of the soul. This is the renewed mind of man, renewed by the mind of Christ. The prayer of a warrior in prayer is a sacral or holy mystery that has an unearthly genesis. By its nature, the genesis of prayer, as well as the genesis of God, does not have a beginning and does not have an end. Prayer is the language of God, identifying the essence of God, the word of God, and the genesis of God. Prayer has always been the mystery of God as it has always existed in his presence as his golden scepter of favor, which is stretched forth to the one that would seek his face in performing his will. The relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit happens with the secret language, the language of prayer. If, however, anyone dared come to him upon his own personal conditions, not being called into his presence, then, God, then God's golden scepter of favor will not be stretched out to the one asking. The results, the results will be that the prayer of this person will be unheard. In the temple, in the time of the Old Testament, God did not only not hear uh, the prayer of this person, but he also killed this person physically. If a person would come to God not being called into his presence, not dedicated to be a mediator or intercessor. He, he's not from the line of Aaron. He may be a Levite, but he's not from the line of Aaron. He could have been any other Levite. And he t attempted to enter into the sanctuary, into the temple. God killed him there. Even if the priests who dedicated themselves unlawfully enter in will, will forsake some, some uh, part in their worship to him, he also would be killed. John 9, 31, Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. God does not have the need to kill us. It's interesting how he killed the people in the temple because the temple was temporary, but the presence of God was real. He kills the prayers of people of the flesh. They think if they pray, uh, they have the inner satisfaction that they prayed. Uh, and he thinks that God has heard him, that he had said what he wanted to say. But we know that prayer is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. 
And it begins not that what I'm saying, but what God is saying. When you come to worship and to the house of God, prepare your heart first to listen and not get the sacrifice of fools. When I speak, I, I'm, I'm sacrificing. God says before you offer sacrifices, listen to what I will say and then offer your sacrifice. Because they they don't know that they do evil when they, uh, tra uh, they uh, replace the two or... Uh, or switch their places. They offer uh, prayers. They 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 don't think about whether they have the right are are their prayers in accordance to uh, God's truth. He just talks about what he needs. Uh, show me mercy. Give me this and or forgive me for everything. God will never forgive you for everything if you don't identify specifically what you're asking him to forgive you for. The <coughs> same thing, Lord, show me mercy. He will not show you mercy <coughs> until you explain what you need mercy in. You remember how the blind man was shouting. Jesus didn't pay attention to him. Even the disciples were surprised. Rabbi, he's shouting. And he said, call him close to me. And he asked him, what do you want? I want to see. And he says, you, uh, uh, you shall see. If he would have shouted, uh, Jesus, he'll, uh, allow me to see. I want my sight. Then he would immediately have done so. But he didn't specify what he wanted. Prayer has to be specific and it needs to be in accordance to the truth. And not just in accordance to the truth. A person who's only dedicated to God the conscience needs to be cleansed and the elementary teaching of Christ needs to be there. The right to come close to and stand before God is the exclusive prerogative of God. No one will be able to or will dare by himself to come close or to approach God, the God that desires to abide in darkness and mystery and in the unapproachable light. Jeremiah 30, 21 through 22. It's talking about who can come close to God. Their nobles shall be from among them, and their governor shall come from their midst. Then I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who pledged his heart to approach me? Says the Lord, you shall be my people, and I will be your God. It means that if you will accept this governor, Moses said, God, the Lord will give you a prophet from your midst like me. And every soul that will not obey this prophet will be destroyed from his nation. Being in God's presence is the task of one governor that will come from the nation seed of Abraham, who already came from the nation seed of Abraham. This is the only begotten Son of God in the status of the Son of Man, in whom and by whom anyone born from God and seeking God would be able to approach and enter God's presence. <clears throat> According to the revelations written in Scripture, our prayer in the quality of a warrior in prayer identified by the virtue of the brilliant stone needs to be continual, persistent, diligent, with boldness, with reverence, with faith of the heart, with thanksgiving, with joy, in the fear of the Lord, in the Holy Spirit, or praying in tongues. <clears throat> in the previous services, we've looked at the first seven signs of prayer, which identify the state of the heart of a warrior in prayer, as well as the quality of his prayer, and turn to study the eighth sign. A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones, Proverbs 17.22. Therefore, one of the signs by which we need to determine the presence of joy that comes from above will be a merry heart that will serve as a medicinal substance healing and restoring and repairing his faith in his trust in God. Broken spirit is a symbol of a hard heart that is directed by the pride of his re unrenewed mind where there is an absence of an atmosphere of upright joy, one depriving God of grounds or foundation to be good, to do good and to heal this person. Broken spirit is a spirit that is disobedient to God, one who doesn't uh, listen and does not heed God, one who is beaten or exhausted, one who is broken, one who is destroyed. The word dry means dried out in disobedience to God, shaming oneself, covering himself in shame, rejecting a good conscience, suffering shipwreck in his faith, dead to God. 
When talking about dried bones, a merry heart is a good heart where the, a- where the atmosphere of upright joy abides, providing God grounds to do good for man or to heal man by the means of his renewed mind placed in dependence of his heart. Doing good is performing good, promoting peace, finding the favor of God, pleasing God, providing good grounds to do good. The word medicine, when it's ta- talking about the merry heart, healing, doctoring, sanctification, purification, dedication, and renewal. In the New Covenant, the word medicine also means the feast of dedication or the renewing of the temple that happened in memory of purification of the temple from profane things or impure things. And to determine, and so a a merry heart will renew our temple, will cleanse it from impure things. And in this way will doctor us or will heal heal us. And to determine the essence of unearthly joy as well as the conditions that we are needing to fulfill so that we can grow and begin to reveal, express the presence of this unearthly joy in our prayers, we've been studying these four components, defining the essence and purpose of the fruit of joy in prayer, the price of obtaining and expressing the fruit of joy, keeping and developing the fruit of joy, the fruits and rewards of expressing upright joy in prayer. Looking at the first question, what qualities does supernatural joy have and what purpose is cover, covered in the spring from which the unearthly joy flows? We've come to the conclusion that in Scripture, the quality or character that is included in the word joy, as with the previous qualities, is prescribed in prayer as a commandment, as a decree and order, and as an urgent military command that is to be fulfilled without deviations. If this order is not fulfilled, the verdict is death or final split or break of our relationship in our covenant with God. Apostle Jude concluded his short book to the Church of Christ, gave the quality of joy its own elevated rank as an integral part of our salvation in Christ Jesus. Jude one twenty. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Looking at the above mentioned place of scripture, we can conclude that for God, fault or blemish and joy is an absence of a foundation keeping us from stumbling into perdition to present us before his glory. The glory of God abides exclusively in the atmosphere of upright joy and is an expression of this upright joy. Blemishes or faults in joy is a stained flaw revealing impurity, abomination, and deceit. A person who has not gotten rid of such blemishes in joy as well as in other other of his characteristics we will not be allowed in heaven but there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie but only those who are written in the lamb's book of life revelation 21 27 this is talking about the bride of la- bride of the, of the lamb and it was jerusalem that came from heaven Determining uh, if there's going to be some kind of abomination or impure thing, that uh, people, of course, will not be part of this Jerusalem or this bride of the Lamb. They're der- determining the wellspring of unearthly or upright joy and the existence in this joy natural qualities, we've come to the conclusion that upright joy in prayer can come only from an upright heart of a man in its state as well as the expression of this state within your words and actions. If within our heart we will abide within the, am- the atmosphere of upright joy, then our prayer will express the quality of this joy. We need to differentiate earthly or regular joy from joy that is supernatural, that has its distinctive roots in God, its distinctive wellspring in God, and its distinctive genesis in God. By themselves, the two natures of joy are two programs that come from different nature springs, God and the fallen cherubim. The heart of a man is a programmable system, and that nature of joy to which man gives his consideration or preference dresses him and rules in his essence. And if we consider or prefer earthly joy, then it from one side will be the means we measure our relationship with God, and from the other side will suppress and oppress unearthly joy. If we will consider the joy that comes from above, then it also will be the means by which we measure our relationship with God. 
Due to its supernaturalism, unearthly upright joy is not able to be experienced or felt upon the level of our physical abilities. As unlike worldly joy, it isn't some kind of emotion or some kind of feeling that lifts your mood. Supernatural joy is a kind of discipline of the mind as the love agape is kind of a discipline of the mind and heart, which creates peace in the heart of a man as well as his balances, controls, and leads our feelings, the emotional aspect of our soul. Therefore, upright joy prescribed in the aromatic spices of prayer is one of the unearthly qualities and names of God himself, and further, the children that are born from him. The children born from him can receive the quality of joy in no other way but in the seed of the word of grace and in the Holy Spirit, and only after be grown and enabled by the means of the discipline of the will, mind, and heart directed to continually abide in the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, supernatural joy in its gen genesis as well as its expression is stable, continual, unchanging, and absolutely does not depend from worldly circumstances or satisfying worldly desires that it <clears throat> about the holy ones in Macedonia that in great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality 2nd Corinthians 8 2 <clears throat> and so the greater they were afflicted the great uh, the more uh, they were uh, abounding in their riches of liberality a chapter higher, Apostle Paul testifies of the same and of himself regarding unearthly joy. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. 2 Corinthians 7, 4. Reading his testimony, it becomes clear that being filled with exceeding joy, which is a comfort, does not in any way depend from and is in no way linked to losses and sufferings on earth. Identifying <clears throat> uh, worldly joy, Job says that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment, Job 25. Even in laughter the heart may sorrow and the end of mirth may be grief, Proverbs 14, 13. In regards to men with unclean hearts and hands that filled the church back then as well as today, Apostle Paul states, lament and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom, James Four, nine. This means that forgiving preference to worldly joy over joy that comes from above and trust upon tr and, and trusting upon worldly joy that people prefer over joy that is supernatural, God will bring man to judgment. Ecclesiastes 11.9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. <clears throat> Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. <clears throat> Turning our attention to the unique wisdom of Scripture in defining unearthly joy, we've decided to look at the virtue of upright joy only within the heart of a man, born from the imperishable seed of the word of truth abiding within Christ. And since the first spring of upright joy is God himself, specifically it is God who is the example and criteria identifying the quality and nature of upright joy. Therefore, the, the supernatural joy is not only the quality of God and the atmosphere in which God abides, but is also one of his glorious names with which he triumphs over his, his enemies. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Psalm 43, 4 through 5. <clears throat> And so talk to yourself, talk to your soul when your feelings are at a zero, when you've lost something, when you are in sorrow, begin to talk to yourself with these words. Why are you cast down, O my soul? My God is my exceeding joy 
I will praise him. When you begin to speak these words, God will have the grounds he needs to dress you into those words and you will immediately feel comfort. Sometimes uh, the circumstances remain the same, but you fall into an atmosphere of comfort. I've many times fallen into this atmosphere at the time of great sorrow. I received great satisfaction and joy that I've never experienced even in regular days when I didn't have sorrow. And it appeared as if it's impossible during sorrow. Yeah, the sorrow remained. Nothing changed, but inside I changed. And that's why I rose above it and the sorrow was not the same for me. My heart uh, sang with, uh, with joy. In the previous services, we in a specific format already looked at seven signs identifying the wellspring and quality of upright joy inherent to continual prayer and stopped to study the eighth sign identifying upright joy in the heart of a warrior in prayer. The eighth sign identifying within our heart the wellspring of unchanging joy is the comfort of the Lord that a person can obtain only within the saving justification of Christ by the preached word spoken by God's delegated one. It means that the spring of unearthly joy will comfort. It's not going it's not the regular worldly joy that a person is glad that he received something materialistic. We've been reading this place of scripture, Isaiah 52, 7 through 9, and we've been studying it. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, your watchmen shall lift up their voices, with your voices they shall sing together. For they shall see eye to eye. When the Lord brings back Zion, break forth into joy, sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. How is it that the ruins of Jerusalem can be repaired and bring joy? We've noted that the reason that God leaves Zion and the reason why God again returns to Zion consists in our worship that stops satisfying the requirements of the breastplate of judgment. Therefore, God leaves us, but when Zion has performed its sanctification and turns to God, his worship again begins to satisfy the requirements of the breastplate of judgment. This provides God grounds for returning and comforting Zion. Looking at the essence of the given allegory, we began to study the image of the bride of the Lamb, that is the chosen by God remainder, in the mountains of God, which are God's heights or his elevations. Job 25, 2, dominion and fear belong to him. He makes peace in his high places. First, the, sh this shepherd is a person that is anointed by the Holy Spirit to present to the chosen by God remainder the doctrine of the kingdom of heaven that is contained in the elementary teaching of Christ. Secondly, such a shepherd is any person that is garmented into the virtue of a student of Christ and is called to be sh to shepherd or to be a shepherd of his own mind directing <clears throat> directing it to seek God. A person who does not have a renewed mind will not be able to control his thoughts. He will come to church, but his thoughts will remain somewhere else in his problems. And these problems will be in his mind. But a person who is a shepherd of his mind, he rules his mind, he will direct his thoughts where it, it's necessary to seek God. Therefore, the word beautiful belonging to the feet of the one who brings good news, this is the shepherd, the one and the other. Pay attention that the shepherd is not just the person that God places to tend the flocks, but every individual holy person that tends his mind. And so this word beautiful belonging to feet of the one who brings good news signify the confessions of the faith of his heart. This is in Hebrew, this in Hebrew means who are these people who confess the faith of their heart? Reasonable, prudent, restrained, sober, chaste, sensible, acceptable or pleasing God, fitting for God, prepared to hallow God directed or aimed towards the goals of God, honor God with holy things, presenting the interests of eternal life, 
benefiting and bringing joy to God's heart, providing God peace. Further, we've paid attention to seven unique components with which we are called to differentiate the feet of the person placed by God from the feet of the other men that are elected either by democratic vote or who accepted the truth but afterwards rejected to turn to profit their salvation and rejected the truth. And so, in this place of scripture in Isaiah, the first is to proclaim peace. The feet of the one who preaches good news proclaims peace, brings glad tidings of good things, proclaims salvation, speaks of the reign of God, shall lift up his voice, sing together with their voices, will all together be comforted. We in a specific format, as much as the Lord has allowed in the measure of our faith, we have looked at first the first four components, therefore we will immediately continue to study the next component. The fifth component, identifying the beauty of the feet of the man sent by God, is presented in watchmen who lift up their voice. As it is written, the watchmen shall lift up their voices. To lift up your voice voice in Hebrew means to raise your banner, overcome weaknesses in Christ, carry each other's burdens, keep your heart in purity, forgive the debts of your neighbor, take the guilt of your household upon yourself. And such watchmen in the body of Christ with the category of the chosen by God remainder are those who bring good news. This is the anointed by God shepherd, also the fruit of the spirit of each individual person that are an organic connection to the chosen by God remainder. Psalm 127, this place will show us how we need to be to tend our own mind or how a pastor needs to be. Uh, the portrait of a pastor, a shepherd, needs to be who tends the flocks. Psalm 127, 3 through 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like an arrow in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. This place of scripture when I was a young man and I was just got married, the church where I grew up, they explained it as bearing uh, children and not to interrupt uh, the, the cycle of, of bearing children, not uh, in any way uh, stand in the way of bearing children. And then I asked the question, so the daughters that we bear, uh, will they not be those uh, arrows? And I immediately saw uh, how they get confused but, and irritated at the same time, saying, don't ask these questions. It says the sons, the young sons, but... And so what are these uh, children? It's talking about the fruit, uh, fruit of our spirit. This is not talking about our uh, body here in the flesh that we bear children, but talking about uh, uh, our, our spirit. The word is the seed. And when you confess the faith of your heart, then whether you're a man or a woman, you receive the male function of a young son. You have the seed. And when you confess the seed, the fruit of the seed, then this word will protect you. God will take it. And when you're attacked, then the word that you confessed will, will speak with your enemies at the gate. And you will not be ashamed. That's what it's talking about. A heritage from the Lord are the fruit of the womb is a re, are this fruit of the womb. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. He has filled his heart and has filled his mouth with confessions. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate when an evil thought attempts to enter. Uh, truly, is your pastor telling the truth? Do you truly believe uh, what is written? Because today, they're already saying, you know, you can't believe all of what's written in the Bible. Uh, you know, uh, we understand that it's written there, but it doesn't work. And I hear this from pastors and not just other people. Let us look at... Uh, that they lift up their voice. Let's look at who these watchmen are. Isaiah 62, 6 through 12. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. 
We know that wall is perfection, the symbol of perfection. If you have this perfection that Christ calls us to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, to uh, shine your uh, light or your sun upon the righteous and unrighteous, and we know how God shines his sun. For the righteous, it gives light and life, and for the other, it kills. Here, the waters are poured out. He commands his clouds to uh, pour rain down for one for good, and others for punishment. If the normal rain in its time covers the earth, this is good for the earth. But if the rain goes and goes and it floods are happening and uh, the mountains are, are destroyed because of, wa- of these waters and sometimes even cities are, are destroyed and all are destroyed people and animals, the same water, the same rain that comes down from the same uh, clouds when you will be perfect that God's love is selective he doesn't love just everyone altogether he loves the righteous and hates the lawless and we've talked about this who are the righteous the righteous person can fall into a captivity of sin and become a captive of sin a, a slave of sin but he's still righteous he's going to suffer in his soul continually from the sin and God calls him righteous, and he has come to take the people out of captivity. But those who drink sin as water and their conscience does not condemn them, those he hates, and that's the one he sends his reign down as punishment. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord do not keep silent and give him no rest till he establishes and till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord has sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength. Surely I will no longer give your, give your grain as food for your enemies and the sons of the foreigner shall not drink your new wine for which you have labored. But those who have gathered it shall eat it and praise the Lord. Those who have brought it together shall drink it in my holy courts. Go through, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people, build up, build up the highway. Take out the stones. The stones are the stumbling blocks. Lift up a banner for the peoples. Indeed, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the world. Say to the daughters of Zion, Surely your salvation is coming. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you shall be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Isaiah 62, 6 through 12. Wine is talking about upright joy when it's talking about wine. <coughs> no, someone else is not going to use your upright joy anymore you yourself will drink this wine this joy because joy in prayer is also such a drink that will uh, bring joy to our spiritual person that doesn't mean we're going to be drunk from this joy as people drink uh, the the actual wine you have to differentiate physical wine from spiritual things The sixth component that identifies the beauty of the feet of this person sent by God is the ability to bring the chosen by God remainder to joy and all sing together. In in Hebrew, break forth in joy is explain and exclaim in joy, to thank and bless God, to plant joy into the hearts, heal the broken heart, to to be dressed into festive garments, bring joy to God's heart, to be satisfied in God and by God. <coughs> Isaiah 35, 1 through 10. Here we're going to uh, see this joy, the beauty of the feet of the one who brings good news, if you have shoes on your, shoes on your feet, <coughs> that are light to the world. This is the spring of light. <coughs> The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. He gives to only the one who thirsts. If if you want to learn, you need to thirst. Who's <coughs> thirsty, come to me and drink. And so when it says the a wilderness or the wasteland is, is dry, the soil of... <coughs> 
It's the soil of a heart of a person. Uh, the heart of a person is thirsty and wants his word. Some people try to explain this as someone poor and we're waddling in this wasteland. No, in your heart, you've, you've, you're experiencing such a thirst for God. You're so dried out with thirst. And God sees this and says, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. And the desert... And so, wilderness and wasteland, a desert is a person who came out of the world, who separated from his house, from his nation, his house, and his desires. The desert is sanctification, a symbol of sanctification. A person has sanctified himself, dedicated himself to God, and thirsts for God. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It's, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even the joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. Lebanon is a symbol of justification. Uh, righteousness and even the joy and singing the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it the excellence of Carmel and Sharon they shall see the glory of the Lord the excellency of our God here's what joy will do when a person becomes glad or has this merry heart strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees say to those who are fearful hearted be strong do not fear but as we we need to tell ourselves this, if our soul is fearful hearted, needs to be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. He shall come and he will avenge you, he will recompense that are making these things, uh, uh, these unpleasant things for you, that are perverting your, your good intentions and uh, blaspheme and do evil things against you. He will come and save you, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the eyes of the deaf shall be unstopped, then the lame shall leap like a deer. That means your surroundings and yourself. When God will begin to do this, then what is was in you before uh, will uh, that was crippled will no longer be crippled. When you will see this uh, and the things that you heard and couldn't understand, your ears will become open, and you will then lame sh then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And so we, we, uh, <coughs> the parched ground is what? Something that, that becomes a pool. Uh, pretty much we, <coughs> it's not yet existing, but it, we see it already in spirit. We're confessing what is not yet uh, existing physically, but what is given to us, and we confess it. We don't feel it, and we are uh, feeling oppressed. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. <clears throat> In the habitation of jackals, where each lay, they shall be grass with reeds and rushes. You never thought what about this. Why is it talking about? You have jackals there? See, God's, all, all, all animals are God's animals, and each one symbolizes something. In the original, this jackal are also wolves, and remember, uh, Benjamin, Benjamin is a wolf. And in this flock, generally, the one that leads is a female. And who, 
And he'll do what? He will uh, share the, the, the prey. They attack and, and they share the prey. And so these uh, thirsty land springs of water, you will receive the opportunity uh, to do something. Yes, these are all symbols. This is, doesn't mean physically you'll have jackals, but God takes these uh, ex symbols and shows in these symbols about Jesus, he's as a lion too, it's written. You don't need to be uncomfortable with these symbols. God created all animals, and he takes the quality of an, a, a specific animal uh, and, and shows it here. A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. This road shall appear inside. That doesn't mean there'll be some kind of road somewhere else, and people will be going on it. This road shall be inside of you, this highway. The unclean shall not pass over it. Upon this road, an unclean will not be able to walk upon this road. It won't be there. But it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. I will remind us of what this although a fool is. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Isaiah 35, 1-10. And so, although a fool, uh, this is the translation that is put here. In the original, it means to hear, to listen, to listen through, to listen closely or attentively, to attend to, to understand, to obey, to be obedient, to find out, to consider. It means that these people will receive the Urim and the Thummim. They will begin be able to hear God and they will hear him. They will hear God and he will hear them. And will, they will consider God's revelations and that's why they won't get lost. But here they uh, take this, a lot of people, even other, I, the church I grew up in, they, uh, uh, they always ask me, why are you digging so deep into the scriptures? Let us just worship and that's it. Even the... Although a fool shall not go astray, I said, no, if you will not study the scriptures and not know them, you will go astray. You will not end up where you want to be. I showed them other places of scripture that uh, contradicted their ignorant uh, way of thinking. They did not want to uh, pursue and, and, and use their energy to understand the truth. Another place of scripture, Psalm 5, 8 through 12, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Pronounce them guilty, O Lord. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. When we will pray this way, and God does this, and further says, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you, when God will... Uh, avenge you and punish the lawless who have filled the churches, the unclean. But let those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those al also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. Psalm 5, 8 through 12. Another place of scripture about this praise as well. There are a lot of them. Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. That is, rejoice, warriors, in prayer, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear. Zion, let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly, who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Those who 
Вот я стесню всех притеснителей. Behold, at that time I'll deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time I will bring you back. Even at the time I gather you for all, I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20. All of these denominations confessions and other places that today uh, mock this small flock. They don't even see it. They, it doesn't even exist for them. They just have these large congregations that are leading and all want to be in these congregations. They go there. They think that if there's uh, that they will be connected to this organization and be members that they'll receive salvation, shouting and 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 they're serving Baal and not serving God. You, if you look at when people came uh, to Jesus, they listened to the Lord. They didn't... One, one person came to my son and said, your, your dad can walk. Why is he always sitting when he preaches? I always, uh, honestly, to be truth be told, wanted to break this uh, uh, pretty much a habit of the people to always have to stand uh, in the church uh, and wanted to break this and actually sit. Uh, nowhere in the Bible you see Jesus standing and preaching. He would sit down and preach to the people. He sat upon the mountain or he sat in the boat he, and he would open his mouth and he would preach. When the rabbis taught, they couldn't stand, they had to sit, because this is a sign that you rule. When you stand, this is not a sign of, of, of reign or rule. A, a king sits, he doesn't perform judgment standing, he sits upon the throne, and he performs judgment upon a throne just for examples and so people when they when uh, they preach preachers or pastors that preach who are uh, sincere to God when they understand this they'll understand this method and as our time is is up right now we will bend our heads or our knees however who is comfortable either standing or sitting, and so we will thank God for the opportunity to have this service, this word. Amen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we worship before you and we thank you for the opportunity to be at this banquet, to see your greatness and the greatness of your word, your truth, over all deceit, all perversion. We thank you that we can rejoice and be glad that we have such wealth and such joy in you. Not looking at the fact that our faces may not have that light and our bodies have not been dressed into that joy, but within our heart it's already there this joy, and we wait for that moment when you will shake the foundations of hell, and when all the nations will see your light upon the faces of your children, when you dress us into the new person created in accordance to God in Christ Jesus in righteousness and holiness and truth, and then the faces of your people will also change. They will be great and they will be glorious amongst those who will see them. They will become surprised. I thank you because we've already received that truth into our heart and we confess it. We call the not existent as existent. We worship before you for this great and glorious promise. Our earth 
is thirsty, it is dried out. We are in the wilderness. We continue to sanctify ourselves before you. Every word that speaks of sanctification, we immediately receive. And if something is wrong, we immediately liquidate it. We destroy it uh, so that you may uh, reveal your glory in the new person so that you may dress us into this new person. And you will take the words, the confessions of our faith, this uh, quiver that we fill with our arrows and when the enemy attempts to come in to those heights then he will be destroyed from those heights or upon those heights and we will rejoice upon those heights and we will praise you upon those heights I believe that soon you will make this great miracle and the one that stumbles or the one that is crippled will jump with joy and be glad from your Holy Spirit, from this great joy and gladness that you give, that will not just be in us, but also will be dressing us as well. May your greatness be blessed, the greatness of your revelations for your people. May your nation bow before the words of your mouth and be obedient to them. Receive your words with trembling so that you would be able to show your power. You said that if you allowed, gave energy to conceive, you will give the energy to bear, bear the fruit as well, the child. You want to conv the devil wants to convince the people that they will never make that time, that they will never be able to. But you said, if I gave time to conceive, I will give time to bear. Every holy person who has received the promise to be dressed into the new person, God will give you the opportunity to be dressed into it. If you had cast off your old man with his deeds, died for your nation, for your house, and your corrupt desires, and have renewed your mind by the spirit of your mind, and have become a shepherd of your mind, then the, may, as the Lord lives before his word, he will fulfill his promise and allow you to bear. You will be dressed into your fruit. May your word be blessed and your truth for us all. We worship before you in the joy of our hearts, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.